go ahead and get us started. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Blake Kimsey. If Gemini Inc. is down in San Antonio, we are north of them here in Dallas, Writing Workshops Dallas or writingworkshops.com. We are a literary uh, kind of uh, online workshop here based in Dallas. Um, and we have been coming together now to do the Big Texas Author Talk for about three and a half years, which is incredible. Um, David and I and Alexandra talked really close to the start of the pandemic back in 2020 and said, hey, let's get together once a month uh, and talk to an author and have it moderated by um, another very talented author. So here we are all these years later, and it's been so much fun. Um, so um, I do love to thank the people who've been sponsoring us, uh, some of them from the beginning, um, who have been making sure that they spread the word or even share the link after we post it on Twitter or Facebook after we put the recording up uh, on YouTube. So we've got Lone Star Literary who tweets about it, puts us in the Sweet. newsletter, and um, there's always so many, uh, you know. Can you give me something to drink? Yeah. We'll just keep you on mute if, uh, well, let's just keep everybody on mute. And, um, but yeah, so Lone Star Literary, so great, so awesome. If you're not subscribed to their literary uh, newsletter, check them out. We also have the UT San Antonio Library System, uh, which also helps us spread the word. And then of course, uh, we have a generous grant from uh, Humanities Texas. Isn't that right, Alexandra? Humanities yeah. Texas. Uh, and so up here in Dallas, we've loved getting to know Gemini Inc. down in San Antonio. And thanks to David Samuel Levinson, whose um, brainchild this whole thing is for bringing us all together. And I'm excited about our conversation tonight. And as my dog enters the house, I'm going to hand it over to Alexandra at Vandicom. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra. I'm the executive director of Gemini Inc. We're San Antonio's Writing Arts Center. Um, our mission is to teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels so they can bring their stories to life. www.geminink.org. Um, we are not a tattoo parlor. Okay, our founding, our founder, the wonderful Nan Cuba, had a twin love of reading and writing, thus Gemini Inc., but I'm really thrilled tonight because we have a wonderful author, Ruben de Goyado, um, with his debut novel, The Familia Izquierdo. And we have a wonderful moderator, Marcela um, Fuentes, who also has some great books coming out in the next year, everyone. But we love bringing authors together for these lively author talks. You get kind of an inside glimpse of their writing worlds. You find out, find out about their great most recent book. And um, we are just thrilled to have you, Ruben, and thrilled to have you, Marcella. Thank you so much for being, you know, um, our August features. And I will hand the virtual mic over to Mar to David, who's going to introduce our author and our featured moderator. Thank you, Alexandra. Yeah, I'm really happy about tonight, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation between our featured moderator who is Marcella Fuentes. She's a Pushcart Prize winning fiction writer and essayist. She's also a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and was the 2016-2017 James C. McCrate Fiction Fellow at the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing. Her work has appeared in the, in the Indiana Review, The Rumpus, Texas Highways Magazine, Kenyon Review, Plowshares, and other journals. She's an assistant professor of creative writing at Texas Christian University. She was born and raised in Del Rio, Texas. So welcome, Marcella. Oh, her debut novel, sorry. Her debut novel, Mala, Malas, June 2024, and Link's story collection, My Heart Has More Rooms Than a Whorehouse, which is definitely my favorite title of everything. Yeah. Summer 2025, our forthcoming from Viking Books. Welcome again. And now I will introduce our featured writer. We're all thrilled to have. Ruben de Goyado is an educator from Texas and the author of The Family Izquierdo, a novel and the young adult novel, Throw. His fiction has appeared in Deloitte Fiction Journal, Gulf Coast, Titans Ferry Review, and Image. Welcome. Please, the floor is yours. Thank the you so is, much. There, the, now the floor is yours, okay. Thank you for that welcome. Um, I just, I actually had a small intro, but then I didn't realize I wasn't going to introduce you, but I just wanted to say that I want to add on to this. 
that not only is Ruben a really talented writer, I loved his novel. Um, like even before I met you, I was like, oh my God, this book, it's so amazing. Um, I will say that I don't often cry with fiction. I feel like as a professor of, of creative writing, like you get jaded fast, right? You're like, oh, whatever. But um, there was a lot that was very moving and I was tearful. Um, so I don't know if that's good or not, but it really kind of was. Uh, and I wa also want to say that Ruben is a very kind and generous person and somebody who does really care about his literary community. And I just really have nothing but good things to say. I'm very excited to be here uh, talking to him today. Um, and wanted to kind of jump in a little bit. Um, I know that you were saying you were going to read a little piece. Can you tell us which, like, what section you're going to read from and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And just right back at you, Marcela is very supportive. I don't know how we started talking on Twitter or something like that, but she's, she's oh been Oh my God, supportive. we were both comparing our essays on Texas highways. And you were like, That's oh, I read always. your essay. And I was like, oh, cool. So what are you writing about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she's written some great stuff and, and we're definitely looking for it. She's very supportive of the community as well. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly supportive of me as an author. I, I'm going to read a section. Um, the chapter is called Host. And uh, the reason I wanted to read this is there's a variety of different things to give you kind of a flavor. The, the novel is a multi-voice, multi-perspective novel. Um, different narrators. This is a third person narrator. Uh, but this is the story. There's a lot of different things coming in with this main character uh, where she's she's the focus of the story. Um, this chapter, her name is Victoria and um, it's Mother's Day. They've just had mariachis. They just had a party on the eve of Mother's Day at their house. Uh, and Victoria is dealing with um, some hurts, past hurts with her husband, Gonzalo. And she's also uh, having a little bit of uh, kind of some, some post-trauma with dealing with uh, postpartum depression. So she, there's a lot of different things going on, but she experiences a vision. So I'll share that uh, with you now. Unbeknownst to Gonzalo, his words brought forth Victoria's remembrance of the first time she had slept for more than four consecutive hours after little Gonzalo was born. Victoria had shaken herself awake and noticed that Gonzalo was not beside her, then checked the clock to see how long she'd been asleep. Her first thought was that the baby had stopped breathing and she had slept through it. When Victoria saw the empty crib next to their bed, she bolted upright stumbled around the house, searching in each room, not even thinking to call out to Gonzalo. And when the blood beating in her ears quieted, Victoria could hear singing somewhere in the house. It was Gonzalo's voice, low and off pitch, which she followed to the living room where he stood barefoot on the rug, lit only by the brightening morning sky coming in through their bay window. He carried little Gonzalo against his bare chest swaying gently side to side. He sang a Spanish song and the lilting refrain of ru ru ru, a mother's traditional dove-like cooing to lull babies to sleep was the only part she recognized. When nursing was a problem and little Gonzalo wouldn't latch onto Victoria's breast, the lactation specialist had told him that skin to skin contact was important to soothe and calm the baby, even if they switched over to bottle feeding. Gonzalo had laughed at the idea, but there he was that early morning, shirtless, with her diapered son cradled in his arms, a blanket draped over the baby's shoulders. Victoria watched them from the darkness of the hallway in silence. She never spoke to Gonzalo about this moment she had witnessed, not to spare his pride or self-consciousness, but because she felt using words to describe it would diminish it. Victoria also never searched for a way to tell him that what he had done for her that mañanita and all those nights after they finally agreed to bottle feed the baby and Gonzalo took most of the night feedings had not fixed everything or ameliorated the postpartum depression she would not name, but had helped her get through it. After her shower, she went into the bedroom and lit the plain white candle encased in glass the religious type sold in the supermarkets. Victoria did not like the other veladoras, the kind her mother-in-law had 
the ones with pictures pasted or painted on them. Suegra believed that the candles were symbols that the Holy Spirit was there in the house, reminding the evil spirits to keep away. And Victoria wondered if the candles had the same power over memories, over shadow selves that tried to reassert themselves. She placed the veladora on the dresser. Much sooner than she thought, Gonzalo came in and sat on the edge of the bed, took off his boots and pants, and unbuttoned his shirt. He slipped under the covers, and she knew she would have to change them tomorrow because the ashen smell would stick to them. He leaned over and kissed her cheek, smelling like mesquite, beer, and cigarettes. Gonzalo paused over her lips, said that he loved her, and she knew that if his kiss had been long enough, that if she had woken up and parted her lips at all, he would have turned her to him, hoping to make love in the darkness. When she gave him none of their signals, he whispered, Buenas noches, baby. Feliz Dia de las Madres, in her ear his lips brushing across her earlobe. Gonzalo rolled over, and soon he was breathing beer heavy, mouth slack, not exactly snoring. Victoria opened her eyes wide and looked up at the shifting circle of light from the candle, which resembled the communion host Abuelita stood in line for every Sunday. Though the house was silent and both of her Gonzalos were asleep, she thought she could still hear the mariachis and the scraping of her family's feet as they danced across the hallway, driveway. As she began to fall asleep, her recollection of the night took form in the circle of the candle's glow on the ceiling. In the host, she saw herself joining the family in the dance, but she pictured herself dancing differently this time, dancing like she did at church when the spirit was strong among the congregation. Then. As the dream took hold, other brothers and sisters came near, some from church, some from her family, pressing in as they danced. Little Gonzalo, Cirilo, the other cousins, and some of the tios and tias were up there in that circle of light too. Little Gonzalo, Seferino, and Micheli waved purple and gold banners that set, swam through the air like fish. Papatavo and Abuelita glided past her in a slow cumbia trot. She could sense, but not completely see Gonzalo there, outside of the host, his presence flickering and swaying for a moment, then fading into the shadows. This final image startled her fully awake, making her heart flinch like it had when she thought little Gonzalo had stopped breathing in the middle of the night. She patted the bed beside her and felt Gonzalo's body. He was still asleep, facing away from her. Victoria pressed her body into his and reached her hand up to settle on his shoulder. She felt him relax, the muscles yielding under her fingertips. When Gonzalo did not awaken with her touch, she brought her right hand of blessing up to his head and it alighted there as she uttered her wrestles over him, not in English or the tongues of angels, but in Spanish. This was the language Gonzalo had learned first and what might make his spirit understand at last. In those dark first weeks of motherhood, when the evil spirit of depression or her shadow self, whichever it was, had threatened to subsume her for the rest of her days and she could not see past it, he had kept vigil during the watches of the night, warding off the maldad with little Gonzalo in his arms. And for this and moments like it, she loved him still. Though neither of them deserved heaven, and Victoria could not know if they would always be together, she wanted to see him there in the expanse of light where there is no sun or moon and the light comes only from the glory of God, dancing for eternity with her and the family. Victoria's eyes went up to the ceiling, and although the circle like the ostia was still there, it was empty now, the dancers obscured by her wakefulness. The air conditioner kicked on, whispered over the candle, and the flame trembled, but did not go out. Thank you. Oh my God, that was so beautiful. That was honestly one of the, one of the passages that I had marked um, when I was first reading it. It's just a beautiful passage. And I guess I really wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about this, this person, this relationship between her and Gonzalo. It's so, um, I, it's so beautifully rendered. Um, there's a little bit, I think, 
very early in the novel, we see that, you know, he he really transgresses quite a bit and, and breaks some boundaries. Um, and it's yeah. here that she's kind of grappling with that. And how did you kind of envision this relationship? It just seems so full. It just seems like a real marriage where it's like, I don't know if we're going to be together. I love him. And in this moment, there's kind of a, like a forgiveness, but also the reality is we don't really know. Like, I don't know. How did you come up with that? I guess it's, it's really great. Um, you know, uh, that's a great question, Marcela. And um, you, I, I, you come from, you know, as a writer, and, and I know there's a lot of writers on here, but you come from, uh, a, when you write, you come from a place where you're taking elements of yourself, relationships you've had, of course, people that you know. Um, and so like all the characters, this this relationship is kind of a, 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 a mishmash of a lot of different people. And, and so you know, as, as Marcelo was talking about, he, he has, you know, there's, there's an early scene where, you know, he gets, he gets intoxicated and he, he basically accuses uh, Victoria of having eyes for her nephew, right? Ridiculous, right? But he's intoxicated. So, and then he ends up, you know, they end up having an argument and he scares her because he's, you know, he, he doesn't get violent, physically violent, but he verbally, he gets verbally violent with her. And so for the rest of the book, there's this, he's on this unspoken probation, right? And you don't really understand, okay, why did, what does she see in this guy, right? Like, what, what, what is, what is it about it until you get to this chapter and you see that, um, you know, for all his faults, all his, you know, all his nuanced character that he is, um, in this, in these flashes of moments where he takes care of his son, uh, he he takes the takes the nighttime feedings for her. Um, I wanted to show how how complicated marriage is because I think a lot of times you know we read stuff, we see stuff in movies, and there's always the villain, there's always the the victim, and they're really clearly drawn lines. And you know he's he's no uh, he's no saint, he's no cheater. Uh, per se, and he's, but he's also, he's, he's not perfect. He's got a lot of problems, but Victoria being the, being the woman that she is, the strong woman that she is, um, she's like, I'm, I'm not going to put up with it. You know, you, you see that throughout this chapter is that um, he, he gradually changes um, and, and he, you know, he feels remorseful for this one drunken night where he, he acted the way he did. So I, I was just trying to capture something real with marriage. You know, I've been married for 25 years, so I have a little bit of experience in that area. So I just wanted to bring that to the page and then, you know, just show how, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, people that have been married, we understand marriage, but cultural milieu, there's some other things that are also coming into play there. Yeah, I really, um, I guess that what you were talking about right now, I think that you're doing such a great job with that. Um, and that is the, the nuances of someone who is a human per human being and not, you know, a villain or the hero. I, I know that uh, that first section, um, the way you wrote it, it was very scary. Um, he wasn't physically violent, but he was very intimidating. And I think that's the thing that's so haunting for her is that she's, you know, he scared her and you don't ever want to be frightened of your partner, right? And that's a, that's a, like a hard thing to kind of get over. Um, and yet we see her here, like noticing his nurturing side where he's, you know, holding his baby to his skin. And, and I just, it's almost like this is like, I don't want to say redemption, but kind of like, she's kind of he's kind of redeeming himself and also yeah. healing her in a way um, that I thought was really beautifully done. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to also jump into some of the other, I, I loved all the characters, um, but some of the, the other female characters that also, and I guess male ones too, actually everyone, uh, there is kind of a theme of healing throughout um, mm -hmm. from, from things that are, and then she says that she says that she would not name it as postpartum, but I think there's, there's a, there's a trend throughout the novel of trying to heal from things that cannot or will not be spoken by these characters. Like you mm -hmm. have another woman who has kind of an eating disorder, but it's like, she's asleep when she doesn't, she doesn't even know that she's doing it. Um, and we don't even know how to name it. Um, and I just wondered, I guess, you know, when you were putting this novel together, were you thinking about it as a, 
as a novel of sort of talking about healing or is, was it just like something that came together as you were, you know, going through the writing journey of the novel? You know, I, I never, I've never been asked that. That's such a good question. <laughs> Thank you. I've never been asked about, about healing per se, but. But it's everywhere. Like, yeah, I'll it is. It. And, and as you're saying that, <laughs> that character, that character, um, you know, the, the umbrella book is, I would say, grace, right? And, and grace is, and their right thing that Oh, I think, I think Ruben's frozen. I'm not sure. Ruben, can you hear us? Like it kind of just. Yeah, I think he's a little frozen and there's maybe, maybe he'll come back here in just a minute, but that might be his internet connection. I'm not sure, but that was such a great question. I want him to answer it. <laughs> well, I, I really love his book so very much. And um, I'm just going to shamelessly plug it. The audible version is so good too. I actually have, of course, the, the actual book. Um, but then I, I bought the audible version too. And the, the character, the people who play, there's like an ensemble cast and it's really good. So, um, if you have a long drive and you want to hear something, you know, really beautiful, definitely buy the family schedule. I get no proceeds from this. It's just all from the heart. <laughs> um, you know, I think he might've just left. He's going to try logging right back in. So we'll get him in here in just a second and we'll pick right back up on this, um, on this great question you just asked. So. Let's just see here. I'll, I'll wait for him, but this uh, such a beautiful reading and talking about the nuance and the characters. Um, everybody should pick up his book. Oh, let's see. Is he back? He might be. I yeah, hope he so. Is. No, I see him. Can yeah. y'all hear me? Oh, there you are. Yep. Yeah. My internet kicked off there. I'm so sorry. If that happens again, I'm going to get on my phone and use my net. <laughs> I'm out in the country right now. Um, so that's kind of my my setup here. Am I coming through okay? Yes. So I honestly like I just wanted to like I like I said, were you thinking about writing a book about people kind of healing or was it just kind of like, I don't know, maybe it's just your positivity. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I I I don't know how much you heard, but what I was what I was saying, and apparently I was talking to myself and I sounded really good. <laughs> um was that you know you know the the healing and I never thought about that question nobody's asked that and I, I love it um, is that healing in the book is kind of a I'm just under the overall umbrella of grace um, and that the conversation I really wanted to have with the book was and 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 Marcela you could probably attest to this too but in in uh, in Mexican American culture and and certainly probably in in Mexican American literature maybe even all of Latino literature we don't have the conversation very often about mental health right so there's physical health that you know this physical decline that you see in the in Octavio Izquierdo the grandfather but there's also is that is is there's there's he, healing from other kinds of you know there's a there's an eating disorder one of the characters, uh, she's a she's a shut in, she's self imposed exile. A, another character, as as we mentioned here, was postpartum. Was certainly nothing. That's not something that was talked about at the time the book was takes place in the '90s. You know, and then certainly not uh, a part of like our culture. You know, the the I was I wanted to kick against the you know, Victoria has to be a perfect mom. Her, her, her mother-in-law has raised 10 children and done so without a hitch and Victoria is struggling with just one and right and so she holds that in because the expectation in the family and in the culture that she thinks is is that I can't talk about this thing and so just being able to to express her feelings to to one person and in this case you know uh, it's kind of assumed that she's expressed it to Gonzalo is that there's healing there's healing in telling your story. There's healing in having a voice. And so it does come out in a lot of different ways, whether that be through physical healing, emotional healing, or just being able to tell your story. I mean, I think that's all the way throughout, even the, I can't remember the name of the comadre that is telling the story in the La Milagrosa Selena. 
Um, um, she's of course telling the story of, of her bestie, um, Maggie, who has the eating disorder, but it's almost like a testimony, like, look, I'm telling you, you need to canonize her tomorrow, do it now. Um, and so I really feel like there is such a beautiful, like even the end of the novel, which I don't want to give away the ending, but it's a happy ending. There's a lot of healing going on. Um, even for, shall we say, some of the villainous characters of the novel, there's maybe a little bit of, you know, I don't know about healing, but maybe some redemption there. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and so let me, look, I guess like just as a general thing, um, what was the writing process for this? Like, I can't imagine just the the ensemble cast you have. I mean, I feel like there's more characters than the Sopranos in this, in this novel. <laughs> yeah, right. There, there's a lot. So um, I come from, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, as authors, we, we use what we know, we share details from our lives. So I come from a very, two very large families. On my father's side, I have uh, 13 uncles and aunts. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and, and so they all have, you know, an average of three kids and then their kids, the, um, my cousins have kids. And so when I go over to their house, I'm, I'm not joking. I have like literally 50 cousins and I don't even recognize like the little ones. I have to look at their little faces and I'm like, I mean, let me see your face. Oh, you're Sergio's little boy. Okay. All right. <laughs> so um, big family, right? That's mm -hmm. one side. And then on the other side of my family, I have uh, seven uncles and aunts and the same thing. You know, we all have, I have cousins and children of my cousins. Um, and so I'm like, how do you tell a story like that? You know, how do you do that? You know, and, and I'm I, like, I didn't want to copy, you know, hundred years of solitude and name them all the same and get confused no because <laughs> you know they're like wait which sarcadio is this I don't, i'm not i'm trying to follow but how do i do that and so what i wanted to do was the the process for me was like i wanted it to be like a party and so the way i envisioned it and i told them with the cover i said you know what make it festive but yet foreboding at the same time and they did it right so you see the papel picado but the way i kind of envisioned it is that you're at a party and you're with your loved ones you're with your family members um, and, and you know how there's always this cacophony of voices when you're at a party, you can hear all the voices and they kind of all blend together. Yet, if you really pay attention, you can hear that one tia laughing on the other side of the room. You can hear your uncle telling a joke over there. You can hear your cousin, your cousins sharing the latest chisme, you know, the latest gossip with each other. So if you really pay attention to that, every person has a unique voice. And so what I, what I, as I wrote it all together, I mean, it was, this is over 20 years, 25 years that I wrote this book. Oh, wow. Um, um, I, I started writing it in 97, but as it all started to come together, it was first a collection, but what I found was there's an overarching theme of this curse dealing with this whole family. And so going back to that theme of a party is everybody has, a, in a family has a unique voice. They all are speaking at the same time, but yet you can pick out different ones. So Maggie has her own voice. Uh, Victoria has her own voice. Uh, uh, Cirilo has his own voice. Seferino at the end. Gonzalo speaks in second person when he's talking about himself. And so I wanted to put all these narrators that they're all telling the same story, but they're telling it in their own voice and in a different way. And hopefully um, I, I was able to achieve that with this book. I feel like you did. It was really beautifully done. Um, and it, it did kind of feel like, you know, we were kind of, hopping to different tables at a party, just like, oh, what are y'all talking about? Oh my God, this, or, you know, different things like that. Um, and I thought it was just really beautifully done. Um, I think that uh, I could see just kind of the, the little, the bits of information that were, that were connecting all the stories. And it definitely was surrounding that first, which again, I think, you know, was manifesting in these kind of unnamed uh, mental health issues uh, and the fear of that which I thought was really interesting was like sometimes yeah. it wasn't even the mental health issue, but the fear of it that became its own thing. And I thought that was really just very striking. Um, and so you're telling me that you've, you've been working on this for like 25 years. Um, and I'm just, I just have to ask you, like, how did you, did you have a writing community or did you, you know, I don't, I was like pretty fortunate. I, I went to an MFA, um, with my four-year-old son and with my husband, 
just like went right um but I feel like it would be really hard um to like I don't know growing growing up in Del Rio there wasn't like a thriving literary scene right mm -hmm. um and so I wondered you know what did you do to kind of connect or were you just kind of writing on your own or you know if you could tell us about that so uh, as, as an un I started writing as an undergrad and, you know, I was probably like 22 or something like that as an undergrad. And I went to University of uh, Texas Pan American, which is UTRGV now. And um, we had a we had a club. It, it sounds corny, but the name of our club was called Odes. And it was the it. Odes, O-D-E-S. It was the Organization for the Discussion of English Subjects. So we really tried hard to make Odes make something, make sense of it. Right. I'm so, so making you a shirt that says Odes now. Odes. It was our it Odes. was our writing group. But it was it was a workshop. I mean, we, we we were, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, but we would get together. One of our professors, Dr. Newman, would uh, get us together at his house and he'd smoke his pipe and we'd read our really bad poems and I'd read my really bad short stories and we'd workshop it and we'd talk about it. And so I, I didn't get like like you, I didn't I didn't go to an MFA program. Um, I basically, we had this little group of, of friends that we got together. Um, and then, you, you know, uh, back in, uh, I guess, 97 or so, there was no internet to, to speak of. You know, we we used to get the internet in the mail on a CD. And we would- Oh my have, God, that's right. <laughs> AOL, you know, we would have to do that. So there wasn't really an online community. And I, you know, I lived in Florida at the time and, and, and in Texas and also in Oregon. So I, I didn't really have a community per se, but you know what I did have, which I felt connected in, in some small way was I had a Poets and Writers magazine. Um, and so I would read Poets and Writers, I would get a uh, novel and short story writers market and I started sending my stuff out. And so this, the first short story that I sent out is actually the first uh, story, the chapter that you read called Turroco. Um, that was the first Izquierdo story that I got published and I got published in Hayden's Fairy Review in 97. Oh, wow. That's a great magazine too. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like, that was, that was huge to me. It's a great magazine. It was, it's a great magazine. I was like, I, that was my, to me, like that was my breakthrough. Um, and then I, I tried to write other stuff. I would write other stories and it just didn't work. And, and, and I kept coming back to this family and every story I wrote in my, you know, even if it wasn't explicitly stated on the page, they were a family member. They were an izquierdo. Um, and then I wrote the, I wrote the Maggie stories. Uh, I wrote Host, which I just shared from. Um, and then I just started, I started doing it. And then pretty soon I'm like, okay, there's something happening here. Um, something with these characters. So then I, one of the characters, Cirilo, um, that you see he 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 narrates a chapter, but you see him throughout the book. He's the he's the teenage. He's the cool cool guy with the sixty nine Impala. I would have had place. such a big crush. He had the butterfly knife. Totally. Oh <laughs> yeah, he's he's like a he's like a you know a fifties fifties greaser kind of kid. You know, he's a really cool kid. They all look up to him. Um, and he was I, Bob I, in La Bamba, right? He's Bob. Kind of like Bob <laughs> without all the baggage, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, that's a great comparison. He's Bob. He's Bob. <laughs> anyway. Richie. Anyway. Sorry. No, no. I mean, I just was wondering, because I feel like it's so beautiful and it's so just rich and layered. And I mean, you know all that, but I just, I just imagine like how, how it must have been like just kind of trying to get this together and really being kind of far removed. Um, it's very, I think it must be very hard. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, but it was to me, it was like I just spent time with them. Like I know, like I'm saying with Cirilo, I started to write a short story with him, and it actually became my first novel because I kept writing. He kept wanting to tell me his story. And so the more time I spent with them, the more I wrote about them. You know, in my head, I would spend time with them. And so I ended up with what at the time was a collection. And I'm like, no, this is actually a novel because it's a bigger story that I'm telling or these telling here. These are not just isolated short stories I'm telling one big story about a family that's amazing um and I guess just like really briefly um actually I think I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to my other questions I had two but I think we only have time for like maybe one um what are so I've heard I know that um I just ordered throw because I have not read it yet but I was really wanting to read it after reading Cirilo in in uh the family Scanto. um but what about your upcoming projects like what are you doing now what's happening there 
Great question. So I have um, I have a book deal. I, I can't say where, but I have Yay! another. I have a but third you have book. one, so that's awesome. Yeah, I do. I have a third book coming out. Uh, it's going to be out in uh, 2024, and it is not an Izquierdo book. There, you're you're going to see probably a few cameos of Izquierdos, but I wanted to spend some time with because I'm like, oh my gosh, do I need to do another Izquierdo book? Like I've been with them for the last you know 20 years here. I need to branch out a little bit. So uh, that is coming out. I got a deal. 2024. I'm I'm still working on it right now, and it's. Um, it takes place in the Rio Grande Valley, but the thing I want to do with this book, and I won't give too much away, but um, I want to write a little bit about Mexico. And so uh, recently, I, I kind of feel felt like, you know what, there's writers writing about Mexico that aren't Mexican in heritage. Like, I need to write about Mexico a little bit. And so it's connecting uh, Mexican Americans to to uh, Mexicans in in a way that uh, that deals with family. So I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Is it? I'm just gonna poke a little bit. I promise, just a little bit. Is it historical or is it contemporary or is it it's, like it's uh, it's contemporary science fiction? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not historical. It's contemporary, and it's it's you know probably takes place around. 2015 16 so it's not like like right now right now but it's dealing with uh you know a couple of years back all yeah. right oh my gosh well i'm really looking forward to that i'm very excited to see what you come up with um and i'm sure everyone else is too um and do you feel like i guess I'm, i am gonna ask i still have like five minutes do you feel like um your relationship to like how much time you have to write has changed since uh these schedules came out or not really yeah, I, you know, I when I when I wrote these get of those, um, you know, full time job either whether I was a teacher, principal, or working as a as a director, didn't have a lot of time. I'm working from home now, so I don't have a commute anymore. So uh, I'm I'm using my commute time basically to write. So I get a couple hours in, an hour or two hours every day, and so I'm way more productive as an author now. And and you know that's always good when you're on a deadline. You know that Marcela, you you been on deadlines yes. before. I was on one yesterday. So, yeah. So it's it's definitely a good deal. I, I I feel like I'm I'm getting more done now as an author than I was before. I um, well I just I also want to say just how much admiration I have for you that you actually you have a you have a large family yourself, I think, right? And uh, you know, I could totally see you as a principal, like you a little bit have that, right? Um but <laughs> a little bit have that um but it, you know, it does take quite a bit of effort to like have all these things and also finish your novel. So bravo, dude, you're amazing. Um, and I know that the next book is going to be also amazing. I can't wait for it. Um, and it's sometime in 2024? Like 2024. Maybe. Yeah, I think. Um, oh, I hope you come out in June. And then we can both come out together. Come maybe. On, come on. <laughs> Let's see. I don't know when in, in, in 2024. I just know like my deadline of turning in like the final draft, but some, maybe 2025, but I think somewhere around 2024, late 2024, maybe December. Or well, early. I'm really, I'm really happy for you and congratulations. And we're all the lucky ones because we get to read it. So yeah, um, and it's going to be different. It's going to be a very different book. It's not going to be a huge family. I'm, it's, it's about family because I always write about family. My first book was, was like found family with, with peers. Second book, this, this large family. And this one is, is also about found family, but it's about how two women a Mexican woman and a Mexican American woman come together and become something more than mother and daughter. They become a family that they don't, they can't really name per se. So that's, that's where it's at. I love that. And I knew if I asked you a little bit, you might tell me a little bit more. Yay. I, I gave it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay. I'm going to turn this over. Um, I think there's probably audience questions and I don't want to hog Ruben to myself. I mean, I probably do, but you know, I can give everyone a chance to. So I'm going to turn it over to um, to see if there's any other any audience questions for Ruben. Yeah, and if you don't want to come off mute, I don't know if we can do that or what, but 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 put some questions in the chat for sure for for either me or Marcela. Yeah, and you can you can you should be able to unmute yourself. So if you have um, if you if you have a question, you prefer to ask it live. Go ahead and unmute yourself, and we'd love to hear that. Otherwise, uh, put it in the chat. But thank you both for such a great discussion. Love 
Um, Ruben, I'm going to ask you kind of an obvious question. Um, but was there any particular challenge you faced? Because I, I do think it's interesting when authors shift genres or when a book starts as one thing and becomes another. It also can be intimidating if you've never done that yourself. So what was there anything um, challenging about going from the idea of like, oh, I'm writing a collection of short stories to making it a novel, like just to nerd out for a second on like um, some writing challenges with that transition? Yeah, that's a great question, Alexandra. The 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 challenge for me was how do I order this thing? Mm -hmm. Because when you like when you're doing a collection and there was a Kali Fajardo Einstein who said it, um, she's like, you know, think when you're doing a collection, think of it as, as an album. Mm -hmm. Right. You 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 collect it in such a way that it's an album. And I'm and I'm I had it organized that way, but then I'm like, wait a second. I'm this is a book. This is a, a novel, right? They're both books, obviously, but this is a novel. Um, and so I had to go back um, and and uh, kind of reorganize things. And then in one of, one of the reviews for the book, they mentioned that it's intertextual in that I reference things. You see things referenced in the past that come up in the present. Um, and so I had to make sure it was it was like a complicated stitching process. I had to make sure that if I was referencing something in the present, um, and, and just mentioning it there, there, there had to be some connection somewhere else in the past. So, um, you know, one of the examples, and, and uh, Marcela mentioned this is a butterfly knife, right? She mentions that, 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 that Cirilo has one of those. Well, in the present, you see that becoming a major plot device in one of the stories, but yet in the past, you see that the grandfather bought it for Cirilo in Mexico. So little things like that, I had to make sure, make sure that there was a connection and I had to look at it like um, the uh, Chekhov's gun. If y'all have ever mm -hmm. heard that, you know, like if, if there's a gun in the scene, it has to go off at some point. I'm probably, I'm butchering that. Please forgive me. I don't have an MFA, but something like that. Right. Um, and so I had to make sure that those little pieces, those little breadcrumbs were all going to, to make sense. And so the way I handled that was um, you know making sure that that all those things were in line, all those little contextual pieces were in line. But I also put in these um, these past chapters that are in italics. And so mm -hmm. when I did it in italics, it's almost like a, a flashback in that you're seeing the past. So that's those are the that was the connective thread between the, the stories where I wrote those after the stories much later. So I wrote those chapters and they're in a very different voice. You'll probably sense that they're more, um, there's more longing in them. And mm -hmm. I wanted to show the reader what has been lost in these, in these scenes with Papa Tavo when he's, he's happy and, you know, there's an anniversary party and, and he's healthy and they're younger and, and they're not having, he's not having all the emotional issues that uh, you see in the present tense of the book. So that, that was really the connective thread. Was that kind of fun or interesting to create a past after you had created a present? Yeah, it, it was. It was a lot of fun. But the, the, the other thing was it was it was, it, you know, and, and Marcela mentioned it healing mm -hmm. because, um, you know, in my introductory notes in the book, you know, I say, you know, there's some, you know, a lot of this is based on family lore and, you know, uh, the characters are made up. I don't know the exact verbiage of, of what I said, but um, it was healing for me because I never got to know my grandfather like my other cousins did because I lived up north. And by the time I moved back down to the Rio Grande Valley, my grandfather was already sick in much the mm -hmm. same way that you see Papa Tavo. So he was he was ailing. I never got to know him like my cousins did when he was younger, playing dominoes, buying ice cream for them. And so for me to write the past, it was a way for me to connect with my grandfather. And so mm. not only was it fun for me, but it was healing for me to be able to do that. And what was what was amazing, and I've never shared this before, but what was amazing to me was that in writing, when I was writing those chapters, one night I actually had a dream of my grandfather um, that we were we were both the same age. We we're roughly you know thirty or forty, but we were just two men of the same age, and we were sitting down together and talking, 
Um, and so that to me, that was like a very powerful, you know, you know, we're, we're Mexican, I'm Mexican and we believe in signs. That's how we are. Right. But <laughs> to me, that was like a sign that like, Hey, what you're doing matters right now. You're, I'm, you're connecting with, with your family, you're connecting with your roots. That's great. I love hearing that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Also, I want to say, like, I think you were writing the essay about your grandfather when I met you. You were yeah. you were writing an essay about, and you told me they had never met him. Um, I think one of the things, knowing that, like, you know, you go into a book that has been written by your friend and you're like, ah, oh, I have outside information, <laughs> right? Um, and I think knowing that, reading Papa Tavo, I was like, this is created with so much love. And mm -hmm. I could feel a longing of someone who maybe, you know, was feeling very wistful about that, so. Good job, man. <laughs> Thank you. And the other question, somebody mentioned, oh, somebody mentioned the audio version. Oh my gosh. If, if you like audio books, I definitely recommend the audio version of the book, uh, you know, buy the print copy, of course, but the audio version, there's six different, um, six different narrators and they do such an amazing job of doing that and actually uh one of the stories if you follow shout out to ursa story podcast they're featuring one of the chapters uh that they got the recording and that, that's on ursa story podcast and then there's an interview with me next week so check that out but yeah the, the audio is amazing i love it i was listening to it i was driving back to college station to pick up some stuff or whatever and i was like i'm gonna listen to it too it was so good um the act the voice actors are incredible oh, yeah. um, so but i don't want to again i don't want to just like take people's time so if everybody else has questions jump in <laughs> uh here's a question how's the valley changed and will it change in your forthcoming novel that's great thank you jaime Good friend of mine, uh, professor up in uh, up, up in uh, San Marcos. Um, so gr great question, Jaime. Uh, the the valley has changed a lot. The valley that I wrote about, and 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 for reference, if you're outside of Texas, we're talking about the Rio Grande Valley down along the border. Um, the valley that I wrote about is a very different RGV than than what's present now, um, and so it's it's almost like a look into the past because I it, it does take place in the 90s and in the 50s and the 80s. Um, so it, it is going to change in my forthcoming novel um, and in a, a lot of different ways. One of the ways is the, the valley is, uh, you know, even though people think of it as one big area, you know, that it's all the same. It's I'm writing about a different part of the valley, not McAllen, which is like McAllen is like the more affluent, more, uh, I guess, metropolitan area. I'm writing more rural uh valley right now because that's where i live and so i'm using that experience to to write this book and i think the the ways it's changed um you know of course it's become more modern but i think the other thing that the interesting thing that has happened to me is that there's been an influx of um like first generation people from 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 mexico from central america from south america whereas we were pretty you know back in the 80s we were much i would say we were much more uh, homogenous in a lot of ways. And so now um, you're seeing a, a lot of different cultures coming into the valley, which I think is a good thing, is a healthy thing. So you're definitely seeing a lot of different, uh, different perspectives and a lot of different, uh, you know, just different cultures coming together in, in the RGV than you, you would have seen in the past in the 80s and the 90s when I was writing or when I was writing about that. See what else? Anything else? Ask me about writing. Ask Marcela about writing. What do we got here? I was gonna say, I I really feel like um, it's a it's not. I feel like such a. How can I put this? Like I feel like you did such an incredible job, and I'm like, like you don't even need an MFA, whatever, man. You you were like you were amazing on your own. I don't know. Um, do you feel like you you read a lot of things like were you just like reading books and looking at structure or like I don't know I had a hard time when I was doing my novel like you know figuring out the structure of my books I was always like oh my god it's a braided narrative and some of it takes place in the 50s and some of it in the 90s and it's like I had such a hard time and I can't even imagine if like I didn't have a writing community so were you what are some books that maybe helped you figure out how you wanted to shape your novel 
You know, I, I read, I read, uh, let me see. This is going to sound, sound strange, but, but one of the influences was James Joyce's Dubliners. I love that book. Oh my God. I love God. that book. I love James Joyce. Um, but he's writing about Dublin, right? And 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 so that was kind of the inspiration. And and you know, you don't see a connection between the characters per se, but I went back. So for me, like I read um Dubliners. The other one I read was um Sherwood Anderson, I believe, Winesburg, Ohio. That's another one that I read. If you if you have if you're familiar with that, oh, yeah. that's that's an interconnected collection of short stories. So I, I went back. So you um, went to the masters. You're like Joy. I did. <laughs> sure, whatever. Boom. Let's <laughs> let's go back. Let's let's see what way we did because a lot of it is you know a lot of what you're reading now. And of course, you know, I read I read other collections and things like that. But but for me, it was you know because I, I I always struggle and, and maybe you you can agree with this. I don't know, Marcella, but I'm like I don't want to be the next insert Chicano author. You know, oh oh, if you like this author, you're going to like Ruben de Goyado. I didn't want to be that. So I was intentional about not reading my peers when I was writing the book. And what's, and what's, what's funny to me is that people compare my book. And this is a huge honor to me that I'm compared to um, Luis Alberto Urrea's book, oh uh, my God. Broken Angels. They'll, they'll compare the family schedule to that book all the time. And I'm like, they're like, did it influence you? I'm like, you know what? I was writing these stories in 97, not to take away from my carnal Luis Alberto Rea, but I was writing like, these stories. I was there first. <laughs> He's definitely paved the way for all of us, a lot of us, but um, but no, I didn't. I, I hadn't read that book until after I had already uh, written my book. So what, what to me the power in that is, is that we have such a shared experience that there's so many commonalities there. Oh, I totally agree. Um, I think I think the thing you're my experience with that is that they when I was uh I guess going on submission or whatever they call it like comps, like who can we compare you to? Yeah. Um, and it's it's this weird way where they can be like, if you like this person, it's like a weird algorithm. If you don't, if you like, I know that when Mike says, if you like Marcella Fuentes, you should read Ruben de Goyado. You should read, which will be great, obviously. Uh, but it's a weird algorithm where you're like, hey, man, I'm just trying to write what I'm writing. Right? I just want to be me. I want to be the first Ruben de Goyado. I don't want to be there the you next. Go. Such. Oh, my gosh. Awesome. No, I think that's, but I think that's, um, I think it's great that you were like, I'm going to look at really just like stories across the board. And um, also Dubliners opens with that party story with the dead, right? It's yeah, like a yeah. party. And, and, and if you go, so go back if you want, I mean, if you want, read I host totally will. again, <laughs> read host or consider host. The story host was an homage to the dead. <gasps> okay. Now that you say that. Yes. There's a I lot of similar me, elements. As a writer this semester, and I'm going to teach them together and be like, you yes. want me to read this. See it. Yeah. And, and I retitled it. And I'm going to tell you, I, I had the corny, a corniest title when I first wrote it, but it was called The Living. I am the living. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> the living. You're like, no one else going to see that. Well, I was like, go, oh, that's time out. That's oh too on the nose. So I oh retitled it. I love it. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, that's really hilarious. I love it. Um, and I will never forget that you were in a book. Now, is your club Ode still going on? Hold on. Don't stop. Sorry, my puppy's mad that I'm not paying attention to her. Is oh, no. Ode still a thing? No. Oh no. That, that's <laughs> like, I have a, I have a picture. I was in the local paper. I'm looking at it right now. The monitor that was like way back in '94. Oh like, my I don't god, even I know love where, it. I don't even know where any of these people. But you know, I, I, you know me. I, I try to stay connected with people. I, I do events. Um, you know, I'm active on Twitter. I, I, I'm just glad that like I have a community now where I didn't before. Um, I would just hope I would go to little writer things and just hope I connected with someone. Uh, back in the day. But yeah, I think community is very important to an author. You got to have people to, you read their work, they read your work, you connect with each other. I think that's a vital, vital piece of, of uh, just being a writer, not just sitting down to the computer, but also giving back and receiving from other people. Absolutely. Um, oh, there is a question. And the question is, wait, what is the question? I thought it was there. Is it there? Maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe I've seen the other question. Sorry, right, here, I think here is. How, how can we as a community encourage uh, 
and support future writers in the RGV. So doc, Dr. Uh, Sarmiento, thank you for that question. Um, I, you know, I would say there, there's, there's a, a huge, uh, more so than, than when I was growing up, you know, as coming up as an author, there's a lot of different things happening. Uh, a lot, of, there's, um, there's the, the byliners out in Harlingen and they've, they're really, uh, a active group. They get together frequently. Uh, you know, there's, um, Edward Vidaure is, is an author from McAllen. He's a poet from McAllen. There's a very vibrant community. They do readings. If you just follow, uh, you know, get get in one of the face because we use Facebook. As some, we're old people, right? So we use Facebook. Uh, connect on there. There there's a ton. There's a ton of uh, a ton of different uh, groups. Like I didn't have any of that. You know, I, we had like one coffee shop back in the day, and it closed within six months. But um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And, I, and that's what I would encourage future writers, future writers to do is just connect with somebody. I'm so darn busy that um, I, I don't um, get to connect with those folks like I would like to, uh, but definitely, you know, I, I do keep up with the stuff that they're doing. And yes, Alexandra, he runs Flower Song Press, which is a great press. Uh, one of my stories got published in the Selena Anthology uh, and they're doing great work. So yeah. I have that Selena anthology. It's awesome. Yeah, it's a great one. <laughs> um, and I think that's, I don't know, I think we might be hitting our, like, the end. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to say because I'm not sure. I'm not the person. Um, but if anybody else wants to jump in. <laughs> well, I do love ending on that note with about community, building community, supporting other people. There's the the essential work we do when we go into the cave to write but then also coming out into the light of day and supporting other writers, other artists, um, which is certainly what happened tonight. Thank you both for just this incredible conversation. Um, so much to think about as a reader and a writer, uh, intentionality. And I just really loved being present for this conversation. So thanks to you both. Uh, Alexandra, David, do y'all have anything else to add? No, this was great. I, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm like, a third through your novel and I can't wait to read the rest. Thank you for not giving away a spoiler, Marcella. <laughs> but um, it was great hearing you read from a host, which is a little later in the book. So mm -hmm. um, no, thank you, Ruben. We, you know, this is one of our highlights of our month to have this author talk. It's so great to Zoom Definitely. your great voices in and have you share the space with us. So thank you for being with us tonight. Well, thank you all. And, and most especially thank you to Marcella, number one, but everyone that hosted us. But the other people... Thank you for showing up for us. Um, you know, there's a bunch, I could read all the names on the little <laughs> Zoom here, but you know what? You made time for us tonight and, and hopefully, um, you know, you got something out of it. So I just want to thank you all for being present for us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you so Good much. Night. Thank you. Good night, Ruben. Thanks, Marcella. Bye.